complaining about these issues won't change anything. Posting status updates about them probably won't help either. And even the most well-organized demonstrations have a limited impact. Is there any way to really make a difference? people have ever heard Aesop's fables. There's a, another book called The Life of Aesop, and in this account, Aesop is a slave to a philosopher named Xanath, Xanath, Xanath on the island of Samos, and he was ordered one day to arrange a meal for a large banquet of uh, Xanthus, Xanthus, that's a hard thing for me to say, his students. And so uh, we'll just call him the king or the philosopher. And so Aesop, he was commanded to provide the, the best food that money could buy. And when the students arrived, they were treated to a starter of tongue. How many people have ever had tongue before? Okay. Uh, the students, they made a few jokes about this, but when the next course was tongue too, they started to be a little puzzled. And then the third and the fourth courses turned out to be tongue as well, and they started to get perplexed. And the philosopher was embarrassed and then turned to Aesop. He uh, demanded an explanation. And Aesop said, didn't, uh, didn't you tell me to find the best food that I could find? Well, what is greater in life than the tongue? For all philosophy and education are made possible through it. It's the source of giving and receiving, greeting, buying, expressing, uh, doing creative work, getting married. It builds cities and destroys them. It humiliates man and elevates him. The whole of life is made possible through the tongue. There's nothing better than it. The philosopher was embarrassed and angry with Aesop, and he said, since you think you know what is good, I'm going to order you to do the opposite. Go off and buy whatever is bad and worse. I'm going to invite my students to get a dime with me. And to everybody's amazement, the next day, tongue. The philosopher was angry, and he said, how can you serve a tongue as the best possible meal one day and the worst possible meal the next? And Aesop said, what? What can be worse than the tongue? What evil is not involved in it? The tongue creates hostility, slander, reproach, envy, jealousy, destruction, and war. Why well, go on? There's nothing worse than the tongue. Many have been ruined by it. The best of foods, the worst of foods, the instrument called the tongue. It can be used for good or bad. What we say with our words matters. Words matter. Uh, scripture reveals that creation itself was brought in and about through the word of God. Psalm 33, 6 preaches, By the word of the Lord the heavens were made by the breath of his mouth all their host. When God chose to enter the world, that he made uh, by revealing Jesus Christ. He revealed him as no less than the word of God. John 1.14, thunders as the word became flesh and dwelt among us, we have seen his glory, the only glory as of the Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Every other leader and king in the history of mankind can compare to Jesus. His words, full of grace and truth, always bring life and salvation. But the tongue as we know, can also be evil. Our words can be deadly. Proverbs 18.21 says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And if words can mean the difference between life and death, it's critical. It's so important that we learn how to control our tongue, especially if you're a Christian. The Bible has quite a bit to say about the tongue and our words. In James 1.26, uh, James writes, he says, If anyone thinks he's religious and does not bridle his tongue, he deceives his heart. He says that person's religion is worthless. How many people want to have worthless religion? All right, not too many. Uh, we're, we're quick to uh, avoid murder, but we often assassinate fellow believers. Uh, we learn to... Uh, leave destruction in our wake by the way that we use our tongues. Uh, husbands have stabbed their wives with words that are sharp as daggers. Wives have lashed out with tongues that cut and pierce. Parents have devastated their kids with, with blasts of venom. Children have exploded at their parents with, with volleys that can level the family like a bomb. And churches have been wiped out by gossip. Words that slice and, and chop people and leave devastation in their wake. Our, our words, they have a correlation with our spirituality and our religion. If we don't control our tongue, it says that our religion is worthless. It's of no value. 
And James, he's going to delve into what comes out of our mouth. He devotes almost all of chapter 3 of the book of James to it. And so if you have your Bibles, I'm going to invite you to turn there. James chapter 3. And now that you're all comfortable, if you're able to, I'm going to invite you to stand in honor of God's word as we look at James chapter 3. James chapter 3. Hear God's word. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers. For you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For we all stumble in many ways. And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing, My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives or grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for its goodness and power to bring life and refreshment where there's death and waste. I pray for those that are here with us that are listening that have been hurt by words. I pray that you'd give them your grace to forgive and to heal. I pray that you'd help those who are actively hurting others with their words. Give them a heart willing to be transformed by your love. Help us all to be good stewards of what you've given to us. We pray that in a time when our nation is being rocked by political divisiveness, hatred, and anger, that that we as your people might be agents of healing and change. Help our words to bring unity. Help them to bring transformation. Uh, We also pray for our leaders, especially those that are are not only facing the the the, uh, challenges of their office, but uh, physical challenges brought on by this pandemic. We pray for our president and his family and staff. We pray for our local and state leaders. Protect them, give them wisdom to govern well. As we look to scripture, help us not only be hearers of your word, but doers. Thank you in advance for what you're going to do. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. So we are several weeks into a series bringing religion and politics back on the table. We were told never to discuss religion and politics at the table, and here we are discussing both. And, and if you ever needed a reminder of why prayer for those in authority is also commanded by Scripture, this week has been par for the course. Uh, frustration, political divisiveness, it's actually an opportunity for the church to proclaim the only source of unity that the world has ever known. Uh, we know that God's will for his church, for us, is to be united as he is one uh, and the church is not a, a, a vehicle for politics. It's not, uh, we're not belonging to one party or another. There, there's no Republican or Democrat in Christ Jesus. Uh, we've been, we're, we're, we're not talking about candidates. We're not talking about platforms. Uh, you're not going to be told who to vote for. But what we're focusing on is what the Bible says about uh, political unity to equip us to be a united church in a divided world. And one of the greatest tools that we have for bringing unity is is actually our greatest liability as well. And that's why we need James 3. And so I'd like to work through this week. We can learn so much about how to control our tongue. Uh, So look with me at James chapter 3, verse 1. Uh, James starts off warning, warning those uh, to be careful 
in their eagerness to use their words, especially in regards to teaching, because teachers, those that influence, those that, that speak uh, in, in a way that uh, instructs, uh, they're held to a higher standard. He says, not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. Now, for, for most people, I mean, uh, public speaking is the number one fear for a reason. All right, and uh, so many of you are like, whew, okay, that's great. Um, I've never desired to be a teacher, but uh, especially in this culture, uh, people wanted to be respected and teachers were well respected. Even in our society, teachers, they, they carry a good amount of influence uh, and they're well respected. And so a lot of people today might want to teach, but the problem was and is today, not, many, not everybody that wants to teach is qualified to teach. Uh, James wanted to remind his readers of this and remind them, hey, there are big consequences for taking on the responsibility of, of teaching, of exercising authority over others. Uh, in fact, Jesus, he warned those that would influence a believing child uh, to sin that it would be better for what? To have a, a millstone hung around their neck and drowned. And Jesus said that. So it is a serious thing to teach. And as a professional teacher, <laughs> I want to be very careful with the words that I use. But James even says that even the best teachers, if they are, uh, are not the divine son of God, uh, they are prone to mess up, and we need to learn to control our tongues. Uh, nobody's perfect, verse 2 says. He says, we all stumble in many ways. And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man. Now, how many people are perfect? All right? And, and so nobody's perfect. So this is a rhetorical uh, device here that nobody's perfect, so nobody is going to never stumble uh, in what they say. If we were, we could control our tongue. If we were, we could bridle our whole body. We can control ourselves. And so James, notice too, he connects the, the tongue with the whole body. He does this because of words that usually affect our deeds. Uh, the hardest sins to control are the sins of the tongue. And, and a mature person is, is able to work towards not just controlling the tongue, but also his body as well. Um, Proverbs 21.23 says, Whoever keeps his mouth and his tongue keeps himself out of trouble. There's some good uh, parenting uh, wisdom there. Whoever keeps his mouth and his tongue keeps himself out of trouble. Uh, the tongue remains hidden for the most part, but, but when it does... Uh, come out, it, it, it un, can unleash devastating power, display devastating power. And so in the next verses, verses 3 through 12, James is going to use six different word pictures to help us understand uh, how small yet powerful and important the tongue is. Uh, the first uh, metaphor, the first word picture that he uses is the bit. Uh, he says that, uh, that like the bit that is put into a horse's mouth by a trainer, he says, if we put bits in the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. How many people have ever ridden a horse? Okay, so you put the small piece of metal, and with that you can direct a very powerful uh, animal that is so much larger than the rider, and you could direct it left and right, uh, tell them when to stop, and when you pull it back, it presses against the horse's tongue, and it causes them to stop. Uh, the next word picture is the rudder. He says, verse 4, Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder, wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue, it's a small member, yet it boasts of great things. And, and, and both the bit and the rudder, uh, they, they overcome contrary forces. The bit, it controls the wild nature of the horse. The rudder, it fights against the winds and the currents that would drive the ship off course, uh, and they must be under the control of the pilot's hand. Uh, they are small, but they have the power to delight or to destroy. You can utter words of life or utter words of death. Again, Proverbs 18, 21, death and life are in the power of the tongue. Uh, the next word picture, fire. Uh, verses 5 and 6, he says, How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. Uh, our country is experiencing the effects of all the fires out west. Uh, having lived out in California for five years, uh, this time of year, it's awful. It just seems like there's fires every single year. And, and, and the valley that we lived in, it would just fill up with smoke and you couldn't go outside. And, and oftentimes, it, it was a cigarette or something would be thrown out, out of a car window. Um, or maybe just a lightning strike and it starts off so small and it spreads to miles. Miles and miles. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire. 
a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. Uh, Words that, that are unleashed can significantly affect not just our life, but the lives of, of others. Uh, and James is strong here. He tells us that, that tongues are set on fire by hell itself. This is important. Uh, for parents, if, if we want heaven's help for our home, we need to realize that, that the potential that our words have for destruction. Our, our words can, can bring a, a death to our kids. We, we might not realize what our words do to our children. Uh, Words can, can set off uh, the entire course of somebody's life. It can cause scars, lasting pain. Um, uh, those of you that I'm dating myself here, um, how many of you have ever heard of the band The Carpenters? Okay. Uh, it was a big band back in the 70s, and, and uh, so you had Richard Carpenter and his sister Karen. Uh, she played drums for a while, and she was also the, the lead singer. Uh, interestingly enough, today she is still listed by Rolling Stones as one of the top 100 vocalists of all time. Um, and sadly, she died of heart failure at the age of 32. Uh, and later it came out um, uh, that uh, this heart failure was brought about as a complication from anorexia. Um, and it came out as they looked back that, that her struggle with anorexia, with this eating disorder, uh, all stemmed back to a, a, a reviewer's comment who, who wrote, he said, he referred to Karen, he said, this man is Richard's chubby sister. And, and I'm sure there were other factors uh, that, that, that led to her struggles, but that one comment uh, led to uh, this flurry of self-doubt, and it led to her eventual disease and death. How many have ever heard the, the phrase, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can never hurt me? I don't know who came up with that, but it's, 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 it's a lie. Words may not break bones, but they break hearts. Broken bones, uh, they can heal with time, but a broken spirit caused by words of death is not quickly repaired. Proverbs 15.4, a gentle tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness or wickedness in it breaks the spirit. And so the question is, uh, how many people have, have we maimed or, or, or killed with our words? Uh, are our children dying a slow death because of biting words? Is my tongue quick to criticize? Do I sow seeds of, of bitterness and, and resentment in my family? Or do I replenish their love tanks every day? Do I tear people down or do I build them up? And so we have a, we have a bit, a rudder, a fire, and forth, a dangerous animal. Um, it's important not to speak uh, uh, words that, that harm and instead speak words of life. And if we don't, we have a problem. Look at verse 7. He says, For every kind of beast and bird of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. Uh, I mean, that can keep anyone humble. Um, we cannot tame our tongue. We cannot tame our tongue. Some of you um, have animals and, and are good with animals. Some of you are able to train animals to do some pretty incredible things. Uh, growing up, my family had a trick. Um, our, we, it, when we had food in our hand, our dog would bark, right? And so uh, we, we, we would have people come over the house and like, hey, our dog can count, all right? And we'd have this piece of food in our, our hand, and we'd say, all right, Maxie, what's two plus two? And, 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 and Maxie would know the food's in her hand and go, roof, 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 roof. And then we, and then, and then we would... Uh, open our hand or something like that, and he would stop barking. And like, oh, look how we can count. And everyone's like, wow, you're the best trainers ever. It was, it was just all a lie. Um, but you think about it, every single animal, it says, has been eventually tamed. Uh, from, the, from the most docile basset hound all the way up to the most dangerous animal you can think of. Uh, lions uh, can be trained to jump through burning hoops. Grizzly bears can ride on horses. Huge elephants can do handstands. We have a remarkable ability to tame uh, large and sometimes ferocious beasts, but we cannot tame our tongues. And, and so then verses 9 and 10, they lay out the, the, the hypocritical nature of tongues. He says, With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. We, we bless God while we, we blast away at others. 
There's something wrong with the picture. And for some of us, I mean, I mean it's pretty obvious. I mean, uh, uh, Pastor Colin and I were talking uh, the other day, and, uh, you know, you'll have uh, some people, and they, they, they come to church, and, and, and they're just, you know, well, what a, what a spiritual person. And then uh, you go online, and, and they don't realize that, oh, other people can see, you know, my, my, uh, my Facebook profile or something like that, and, and you see what people uh, say. And, and, and so with the same mouth, we can come to church, and we can sing praises, and with the same mouth, we can curse others. And James says, this ought not to be so. And then he says, uh, another word picture, the fifth one is a spring. Uh, it, it shows the impossibility, very penetrating question. It says, does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? And the answer is no, it, it doesn't. It, it just as impossible it is for you to have a spring uh, that pours out both sweet and, and sour or sweet and salty water, it's inconceivable that, that a tongue would, would, would have both righteousness and, and rumors, uh, blessing and blasting, compliments and cursing. And then the last word picture, very closely related, he says, fruit. Uh, can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives or a grapevine produce figs? And the answer is no. He says, neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. Uh, you have a, a tree, and if you have a fig tree, we used to have a fig tree in our, our, our backyard and out in Cali California. Uh, we expect it to have figs on it. Uh, you have a grapevine, you expect to have grapes. Uh, nature reproduces after its kind. And what James is saying, he says we need to be consistent. What comes out of our mouths is a reflection of what's in our hearts. Uh, so, so pretend with me for a moment. Just imagine uh, that I have an apple tree in my backyard, and, and every year it grows these sour, hard, inedible apples, and it drives Christy crazy. Right? Imagine, this is just for pretend, remember. Um, so one day, Seth, uh, Christy says to me, she says, Seth, why would we have this apple tree if we could never have these apples to eat? And so I'm a loving husband, I think, and I ponder. I want to help this gal that I love so much. And my spiritual gift is solving my wife's problems. And so I, I, I think and I, I contemplate. And after some Excel spreadsheets and some research, I say to her, I, I have the solution. I think I can fix her apple tree. And so she's a, a bit confused, but she's very excited. And so Saturday morning, she looks out the window, and she sees me carrying uh, some items. I'm carrying a big, tall ladder, uh, some branch cutters, uh, an industrial pneumatic nail gun uh, that I bought just for this project, of course, and, and three bushels of red, delicious apples. And she watches me climb up the ladder and very carefully cut off all the inedible apples, and I nail red delicious apples carefully and symmetrically all around the tree. Now, what is Christy thinking, right? She's probably thinking my mother was right. <laughs> What's going to happen to those apples? They're going to rot because they're not attached to the life-giving resources of the tree. Uh, more importantly, what kind of apples is that tree going to grow next year? Those small, hard, sour, inedible apples because there's been no organic change in that tree. The, the tree is producing that kind of apple year after year. There's something systemically wrong with that tree down to its roots. Uh, Jesus said the same thing in John 15. He said, I am the vine, you are what? The branches. Every uh, and, and he says, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. He says, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do a lot of things. No, apart from me, you can do nothing so people are not my problem situations are not my problem my, my upbringing, my family life uh, past abuse is not my problem, circumstances are not my problem, uh, locations are not my problem, politics is not my problem my problem is my untamable tongue that stems from my untamable heart my communication problem is me and I'm convinced that, that so much of what we do in an attempt to, to change our tongue, to sound better, it is nothing more than just apple nailing. 
And so what I want us to do, I want us to look through a couple uh, applications, some action steps. It's not enough just to uh, read this and say, oh, wow, the tongue is really powerful. That's great. Or, or, or just understand the dangers of the tongue and, and be warned about the dangers of the tongue. If, if we want to have change, or if we want to have change, uh, we need to take care of our heart. And so let me give us some applications here. Uh, first of all, uh, we need to consume truth. Okay, we need to take care of our heart, uh, to fill our mind with God's truth rather than the world's lies. The, the tongue, it's the overflow of our heart. What we feed our hearts, uh, the overflow of that comes out of our mouth. And so the question is, are, are we nourishing our heart with lies or are we nourishing our heart with truth? And where's the best place to start? With, with God's truth. Uh, if, if you're just starting off, uh, maybe read Proverbs. Uh, there's 31 Proverbs uh, chapters in Proverbs. Uh, usually there's 31 days in the month, depending on the month. And so you can read one each day. You can read a, a, a chapter of James every day and, and, and repeat it. After a month, you'll have read through almost the entire book of Proverbs and James six times. Almost every chapter in Proverbs has something about the tongue. Uh, this weekend, you'll read from Proverbs 4. Uh, in verse 23, it says, Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flows the springs of life. Put away from you crooked speech and put devious talk far from you. Uh, Ted Tripp said uh, that the book of Proverbs is a, a treatise on talk. And I, I, he says, I would, I would summarize it this way. Words give life, words bring death. You choose. What does this mean? It means you've never spoken a neutral word in your life. Our words always have direction. If our words are moving in a life direction, they're going to be words of encouragement, of hope, of love, of peace, of, of unity, of, of instruction, wisdom, and correction. But if our words move in a death direction, uh, we have anger, malice, slander, jealousy, gossip, division, contempt, racism, on and on, violence, judgment, condemnation. Uh, words always have a direction to them. And so uh, we, we can never think that our words don't matter. Words always matter. Uh, second, you need to think first. Uh, you can write this down, a little acronym. Uh, five questions uh, using the, the word think. Uh, first T, is it true? Uh, remember this rule about gossip. The more interesting it is, the more likely it is to be false. All right? So is it true? Uh, H, is it helpful? Uh, will your words help bring about a solution to the problem? Uh, third, I, is it inspiring? Will your words build up someone? Fourth, N, is it necessary? Do we have to say anything at all? And fifth, is it kind? Are words based on desire to help? Paul kind of said it like that in Philippians 4.8. He said, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, pure, lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's anything excellent, anything worthy of praise, think about these things. And so uh, we need to consume truth. We need to um, uh, think first. Third, we need to talk less. I like this one. Uh, your chances of blowing it with your words are far less and, and probably proportional to the amount of time we spend with our mouth open. Um, Abe Lincoln, he said, it's better to remain silent and be thought a fool than to open your mouth and remove all doubt. <laughs> um, Calvin Coolidge, uh, for us Vermonters, he said, I've never been hurt by anything I did not say. Proverbs 10.19 says, when words are many, transgression is not lacking, but whoever restrains his lips is prudent. Uh, maybe your mother said it like this. If you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. Uh, King David, when he, when he saw how words uh, got him in trouble, he wrote this psalm in, in Psalm 39. He said, I will guard my ways that I may not sin with my tongue. I will guard my mouth with a muzzle, he says, so long as the wicked are in my presence. Consume truth. Think first. Talk less. Fourth, build up others. Uh, the Bible continuously reminds us to build each other up, to encourage one another with our words. Uh, I've done a lot of uh, marriage counseling, a lot of pre-marriage counseling, uh, so much conflict. In fact, when I do pre-marriage counseling, I tell the couple, I was like, tell me about your first fight. 
right? <laughs> uh, um, and because they will have a fight. And, and the question is, how are we going to respond when we fight? Couples can tear each other down instead of building each other up. And, and most often, wor- uh, fights in, in relationships, they are miscommunications. They are fights over words. And the question is, in our relationships, are we speaking words of death or words of life? Are we energizing our relationship with words, or are we tearing each other down? And I think this is a huge opportunity for us as a church because there are so many people that, that are looking for encouragement and hope and, and to be built up. People are depressed, people are frustrated, people are anxious. And with a word, we have the power to change that. Proverbs twelve twenty five: anxiety in a man's heart weighs him down, but a good word makes him glad. Um, Chuck Swindoll, he was uh, the, the chancellor of the, the seminary that I went to, and uh, he tells a story about a guy that he went to seminary with, and, and this man had a big red birthmark that, that covered half of his face, and, and Chuck got to know this guy a little bit, and he finally got up the courage to ask him uh, what had happened. And so his friend answered and told him what his dad had told him. And this is what, what his friend's dad had said. He said, son, that birthmark is where an angel kissed your face. You have it so I can always pick you out of a crowd. Swindoll's friend then turned to, to Chuck and said, you know, I almost feel sorry for all those people that don't have a birthmark. That, that dad spoke words of life to his son, and the son was still living off those words decades later. Ephesians 4.29 says, Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as, as good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who fear who hear. So I'm going to challenge us. Give one encouraging word to everyone you talk to every day. All right? In every conversation, try to say one encouragement. And you're going to, have to be deliberate about this. Uh, you'll, you'll have to tell your, your son or, or daughter something to build them up. Uh, teens, uh, you'll have to give a, a life-giving word to your parents. Siblings, you'll have to say something kind to each other. Uh, couples, you'll have to encourage one another at least once a day. Try that. Just see what God does with that. Consume truth. Think first. Talk less. Build others up. And lastly, have heart surgery. Again, the problem with our world is not politics. The problem with the world is not a pandemic. The problem with our world is a heart problem. As James says, uh, why is it so hard to say the kind of things with our tongues? It's because the Bible says uh, that we can never have strength enough to tame our tongues. The tongue is impossible to tame because uh, all the garbage that comes out of our mouth, uh, it comes from a garbage in our heart. Matthew 12, Jesus said, uh, gave us some insight in this. He said, Matthew 12 and verse 34, he says, how can you speak good when you're evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good person out of, out, of, out of his good treasure brings forth good. The evil person out of evil treasure brings forth evil. And then he says, for by your words, you will be justified. By your words, you will be condemned. Uh, God doesn't want us to leave here and uh, without trying to tame our tongue. And, or, or He doesn't want us to leave here trying to tame our tongue in our own strength. That's not what he wants. It's impossible. It's, it's more than just willpower. It's more than just, hey, I'm going to do better uh, this week. Our natural state, we have to understand, it, it, or, or it's, uh, the tongue is a restless evil. And so if we want to stop bringing harm with our words and begin speaking words of life, we need a different heart. And the good news is Jesus specializes in heart transplants. If anyone here has never allowed Jesus to change you from the inside out, it's time for heart surgery. If we keep our old heart, we're going to continue to just launch verbal grenades and, and, and live like we've always lived. But we can ask Jesus right now for a new one by turning our life over to him. We can have a fresh start, a new beginning. Because only God can give us the power to build others up instead of tearing them down. We can be a dispenser of life words instead of death words. But first, we have to be rightly related to God. Jesus doesn't want us to leave here trying to do it in our own strength, and he certainly doesn't want us to leave here without a relationship with him. Uh, the Bible says that the salvation in Jesus Christ is through repentance. The, when, to repent means to turn. And, and, and what causes that turn is coming with, 
to grips with the fact that I'm going the wrong way. I'm a sinner. I deserve death. And Jesus Christ gave up his life on a cross and died uh, paying what I deserved. He conquered death by rising from the dead so that those who believe in him can worship him and have a new life. A part of repentance is also confession, interestingly enough. That you don't need to repent to me. Uh, you don't need to repent to a priest. You can repent right here and right now by speaking to God, by using words. You can talk to God himself. Romans 10.9 says, If you confess with your what mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified. With the mouth one confesses and is saved. I'm going to close us in prayer and, 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 and transition us to a, a time of worshipful response where we can surrender. Before we can worship God, we need to have a right relationship with him. And that all starts by, by turning from our way to his way. Our way leads to death, and his death provided a way to eternal life. So I'd like everybody's head to uh, be bowed, everybody's eyes closed, and let's pray. Father, uh, Many of us are feeling very convicted right now when we, when we take an honest assessment of our words. It might be revealing that, that, that I have a heart problem. And maybe right now, where, where you, wherever you're sitting, wherever you're listening, you are realizing that you need to get right with God. You need to walk in holiness. You, you want to come to the cross and, and, and be forgiven. You don't want to play church any longer. You don't want to hide in the shadows any longer, but you're ready to give your life to Christ. And I pray that you would do that right now, right now as your head is bowed and your eyes are closed. If you're listening right now in mind, if you've never really personally surrendered your life to Christ, uh, maybe you've had a religious experience in your past, but you're not walking with Jesus. You're not walking in obedience to him, and, and you want to turn from that. You can get right with God. You can have your sins forgiven. If that's you, if you're, if you're listening right now, and I would love to pray for you, would you just put your hand up in the air if you want to get right with God right now? If you're watching from home, I, I can't see you raise your, your arm, but God can see you. You can raise your hands to him right now. I'll still pray for you. And Father, I pray for those that might have their arms outstretched to you and surrender. I pray, Lord, that you would change their heart, uh, that you would change their life forever in Jesus' name. And if that's you with your arms outstretched, I want you to say this out loud with me. Say these words from your heart. Say them to God. Lord, I give you my life. I know that I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. I believe that Jesus died on a cross that he rose from the dead and he did it for me. I turn from my sin. I turn to you as my Savior. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Give me power to live for you. In Jesus' name. Wow. We know God as a as the giver of life. We know him as the alpha and omega. We know him as the one who restores, the one who reconciles and the one who brings about transformation. And he did that through the gospel. The gospel in which Jesus came to this world and he died on a cross, he was buried in a borrowed tomb, and he rose on the third day so that you and I can have everlasting life. So as we enter into our time of communion, we do this as a remembrance, as a reminder that he is still on the throne and that he would leave his throne to come to this earth to take on the cross to break his own body so that we could have everlasting life but the Bible's clear the Bible is absolutely clear 
that before we go into our time of partaking in the elements of the Lord's Supper, that, that He would ask us, He would command us to do a self-examination to see where our heart truly is and if there is a need of repentance. So that's what I want to do before we go any further, before we partake of the communion. I want to take a moment with every head bowed and every eye closed. If you need to go make restoration with your brother or your sister, if you need to repent of something, friend, today is the day. It's not tomorrow. God is serious about that. He would send His Son to die on a cross, and He's serious about us partaking with Him in communion. And so, I just ask you, what does that look like for you right now? Let's take a few moments just to do a, a reflection on our own life and our own heart and give it to God. Father, you are glorious. Everything bows to you as the great creator and sustainer. You are perfect, you are holy, you are righteous, and we are not. And so we ask that you would rid us of our sin. That you would reveal in us just a heart that would be true of repentance. And Father, as the Bible says, as your word says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, I ask that you would reveal in us how our heart is. Father, we confess now, right now, if our heart is and our mouth is used for gossip rather than gospel, we pray you would use us for your glory. We love you so much, and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three and 24 says, I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. As we move forward in our time of worship, we have, I believe, one more song. If you still feel the need of speaking with the Lord, go ahead and still be seated. Have a moment to talk with Him. Have a moment of repentance. If you feel like you want to worship by standing up and singing out, feel free to do so as well. Can we uh, turn the house lights down? If you don't mind. So yeah, as Colin said, uh, if you uh, want to stand and worship with us, it's great.
it couldn't fail me. A man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough. And you came along and put me back together. And every desire is now satisfied here in 